Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need to know in order to absolutely dominate on test days. So today is no different. We'll be talking about content related to the genital urinary system. So as you recall, the genital urinary system is represented on the NPT. About four to seven questions on this. It does cover all the exam categories from examination, differential diagnosis to interventions. And so today we'll be talking about a practice question related to that. Uh, but before we do, just a quick reminder that as we get closer and closer to exam day, I do run a fresh VIP cohort each quarter. This is the one that I personally run. This is the time when we spend uh, spend time on every content area, but we spend most of our time on on practice questions during our live sessions. That's where we go over practice questions together, much like what we're doing here, just in a longer form format. You get to to interact with me make sure that each of your questions are answered. As we go through it, we talk about the pitfalls, the tricks, and the ways that you can make sure you have the content really solid in your mind for test day. So that's in the VIP class. And then as we get closer and closer to exam day, we do run a crash course just the last three weeks right before test day. Uh, that is complimentary access to those of you who are in our VIP class. You'll get complimentary access to that as well as our full practice exams. You'll enjoy those. We have six of those currently as I'm doing this recording. We are adding them all the time. So be sure to sign up for the VIP class. All right. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and talk through our practice question here. Uh, what I'll do is I'll read through the question, uh, give you a moment to, to answer it or consider what the answer is, and then we'll talk about the answer together. When considering a treatment strategy for a patient with neurogenic bladder dysfunction, which of the following are the least important goals to consider? So when considering a treatment strategy for a patient with neurogenic bladder dysfunction, which of the following are least important goals to consider? Number one, prevent bladder over distension. Two, prevent bladder relaxation. Three, prevent renal damage. And four, prevent urinary tract infections. So one more time, prevent bladder over distension, prevent bladder relaxation, prevent bl renal damage, or prevent urinary tract infections. So this question is obviously talking about neurogenic bladder dysfunction. The correct answer is that number two, preventing bladder relaxation, that is the least important thing because neurogenic bladder is typically manifest by a, a hyperreflexic or spastic bladder where you have excessive detrusor activity of the, obviously the, the detrusor muscle of the bladder, you have excessive activity there. So almost always what happens is that with that spasticity, you not only have spasticity of the detrusor, but you also have spasticity in the urethral sphincters, specifically the internal urethral sphincter, which is under smooth muscle control. And so if you have excessive contraction of the pelvic floor, that will lead to urinary retention. So very often these folks, they present with, with a multitude of, of different types of incontinence. However, the most likely thing with neurogenic bladder is that they will experience urge incontinence. So urge incontinence, as you recall, is when there's some type of, of instigating factor, some trigger that hits the patient and suddenly, because of the hyperactivity of the detrusor muscle, you'll get this, this overact, overactive detrusor, this overactive voiding that will occur suddenly without any any real stopping it. It just kind of comes in a in a strong wave and the patient is unable to stop it. So that's what's called urge incontinence, where you have some type of trigger. Almost always there's some type of psychological or environmental trigger. A lot of times this is called key in the lock syndrome. When you're getting close to home, you got the key in the lock, you think about going to the bathroom and suddenly boom, it hits that detrusor muscle with a great deal of force. <laughs> so typically speaking, you want to encourage more bladder relaxation. Obviously, this has to be in a controlled, you don't want to over relax the bladder because you still need some contraction from the detrusor muscle. However, one of the once you do have catheterization in place where you're not worried about the pelvic floor, then you would possibly use anticholinergic agents. So anticholinergic agents, what they do is they they prevent the the neurotransmitter acetylcholine from going through the neuromuscular junction, which reduces the activity of the muscle. And by reducing the activity of the muscle, you would reduce that hyperreflexivity, which is classic or characteristic of neurogenic bladder. Now, as far as what causes neurogenic bladder, typically this is from lesions to the spinal cord proper or to the cerebral cortex. So we're talking about brain injury or spinal cord injury. 
above the S2 level. This is where you get, and this is where it's always confusing, but S2 in the spinal cord. So we're talking about conus medullaris and above in the proper spinal cord, yeah, in the spinal cord proper, that's where you'll find the control centers for micturition or for, for bladder voiding. So therefore, neurogenic bladder is most likely to occur in spinal cord injuries that are above conus medullaris, so in the actual spinal cord, or in the cerebrum, talking about traumatic brain injuries, brain tumors, cerebral palsy, cerebrovascular accidents, all these, uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, yeah, there's a number of, of cases where you can develop neurogenic bladder in some type of upper motor neuron disorder. And I guess that's the moral of the story here, is that neurogenic bladder is most likely to be, sh to be seen in upper motor neuron disorders. So back to the question here, it says, when considering a treatment strategy, what would you want to do? Well, you'd want to prevent bladder over distension. Usually this is by, via catheterization. So catheterization or via some type of bladder program. This is where you do timed voidings and controlled fluid intake. So just think of it that you're on a schedule. So this is like, so I've got a couple of kids and during potty training, that's what you do is you control fluid intake. So you monitor fluid intake and then you have timed voidings, meaning you know every every certain period of time, just whether you feel like you have to go or not, you go to the bathroom. Now, generally speaking, the bladder, folks who are on a bladder program, they're encouraged to go and attempt voiding every two hours. This is that pattern where they have adequate fluid intake and adequate micturition, trying to balance that, and that's the bladder program. So number one, prevent bladder over distension just because that can, that, that just really messes things up. You get that bladder over distension, it triggers the detrusor muscle, so you get even more activity. Preventing renal damage, so fluid retention. So anytime you get lots of fluid built up in the bladder, then you can damage the kidneys. And it's also, you get the high, high possibility of developing urinary tract infections when you have bladder retention. And again, neurogenic bladder is not just about the bladder, it's also about the pelvic floor. So that's why you get a lot of urinary retention because you're filling, filling, filling. You're not getting good relaxation of the pelvic floor. And a lot of times that's one of the programs or one of the, one of the bladder training protocols that you'd see would be not only timed voiding and controlled fluid intake, but also encouraging full relaxation of the legs and the pelvic floor, trying to prompt a full emptying of the bladder, a full emptying, the entire, the entire bladder contents to be emptied. By so doing, you'll find that you'll get better yeah, you, won't, you won't have as much fluid retention and so therefore decrease the chance of urinary tract infection and renal damage. So all that to say that in this case, this is a negatively worded question asking about what's the least important goal. So preventing bladder relaxation is least important. Rather, you'd want to encourage bladder relaxation to the point where it's not overactive. And like I say, neurogenic bladder, that's something to it's from an upper motor neuron disorder. Think of it like spasticity. It's just an overactive bladder. Good. So with that, that's a good discussion of the renal and urological system related to the genitourinary system. Again, a handful of questions, four to seven questions on the entire system. So certainly not something you'll see a lot represented on the test, but they will ask you questions like this related to like a spinal cord injury. Someone has neurogenic bladder, what type of, of urinary interventions would be required? So in this case, for neurogenic bladder, the best interventions would include timed voiding, pelvic floor relaxation, possible catheterization with anticholinergics trying to reduce the spasticity. That's the take-home point here. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and bring today to a conclusion. Again, thank you so much for joining me in these podcast episodes. I hope you enjoy them. You know, I, I get a big kick out of going through these. And if you enjoy it, please be sure to leave us a five-star review. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. You can also check out our other content over on YouTube and Facebook, anywhere else you listen or you check out social media. You can find us over there. A lot of good content. Check out ptfinalexam.com for all of our latest course offerings. And I will catch you in the next episode. Thanks.